Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you're having a Tuesday. I don't, it's all blurring together. Yeah, it's a Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. And hey, buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is we had Mia Khalifa in the news. What'd you do, Mia? Why are you trending on Twitter again? If you don't know Mia, she's a massive internet personality, a sports commentator, but also many know her from her brief time working in the adult film industry. And she was trending in part because there was a rumor circulating that she actually died. But in fact, Mia is not dead. She's alive and well and also responded to the hoax with some humor. Tweeting, please don't think I'm not keeping track of each of my friends that haven't sent condolence flowers yet. I see you. Also along with this, Mia's been getting a lot of attention because of a TikTok she put out that seemed to be her swinging at singer Madison Beer. In that TikTok, Mia revealed that she just had a nose job, writing in the caption, I'd never hide behind a tree. Don't compare yourself to anyone on the internet. You're beautiful. Also tagging her surgeon, who she thanked for changing her life, with many suspecting that her comment there was a reference to Madison Beer, who was recently criticized for appearing to hide behind a tree outside of a place people described as a plastic surgery center, seemingly to avoid being photographed, which, if that was the goal, it did not work. And those photos in particular caught a lot of attention because Madison has been adamant that she has not had plastic surgery. Reportedly, she has admitted before that she had lip filler when she was younger, which she regretted and later had dissolved. But a lot of people online often and accuse her of setting unrealistic beauty standards, which she gets very frustrated by and usually hits back against by saying that she always tells girls not to compare themselves to others. There's also been this environment where she's repeatedly trying to shut down rumors of her having work done, even prompting a popular plastic surgeon on TikTok to apologize for suggesting she had a nose job. Right, so with these recent photos surfacing, you have many calling her a liar, or at the very least saying they're now suspicious of her. Also, uh, in case there was any doubt that Mia was referring to Madison, one user wrote, Mia Khalifa shading Madison beer is something I never thought I would see. Mia responded, I will be shading anyone who sets unrealistic beauty standards standards for young, impressionable fans. And also going on to say, it's fucking dangerous and wrong and most of all, irresponsible. Be better, Madison. And then finally, one of the main reasons that Mia was trending is she is once again being vocal about her experience working in the adult film industry. And in part, this discussion reignited after a TikTok user posted a video with the text, when you realize Pornhub pays you 20K to be in a video without your face in it. To which Mia commented and replied, girl, don't do it, it's not worth it. Ran a number of people screenshot it, that became a whole thing. And with that, people began talking about Mia's experience, sharing some of her old interviews and writing things like, Mia Khalifa was only in the adult entertainment industry for three months, was barely compensated for the amount of money her videos have brought in, and has been shamed within our society. And that in part in reference to a comment Mia made last year saying she only made a total of around $12,000 while working in the industry. Mia also retweeting and responding to some of these posts, writing, please, please, please think about this if you are considering the sex industry. They make it impossible to rectify your regrets should you have them in the future. Also to people saying she deserved to be paid more, she said, I'd rather have it removed than take a dime from that bag. I was offered millions to return for one video and felt violated all over again by the sheer audacity that they thought my body was contingent on the right price, years after I started speaking out against industry practices. And also further explaining the impact working in the sex industry has had on her. Death threats, lost my family, lost my sense of privacy, lost the right to my body, lost my dignity, lost my mental health, no chance at first impressions. Few brands will work with me, makes my marriage harder, I worry about my future kids. But also, to be clear, she did say that she's not against sex work, but against how sex workers are treated, especially the young ones who want their lives back years down the line. And while of course she received some criticism here, in general, many people actually supported but ultimately, that's where we are. And as far as where I'll end this story, one, I personally think sex work is work and there shouldn't be a stigma against it. Two, we should allow people to move past their past, who they were, things they've done, as long as it's stuff that was, you know, kind of a personal choice, didn't affect others, right? I'm not talking about like Bill Cosby. And three, regarding plastic surgery, it's, uh, I don't agree with shaming someone because they got plastic surgery. And I also feel uncomfortable when it involves a situation where someone is accusing someone of getting plastic surgery. Like Madison Beer in front of that place, she could have been there for anything. She could have been there for a friend. She could have been there for acne, a facial. I, I went to the website for that place. They offer a ton of treatments. And the only place where I have like a, a real hard line that I'm against something is if someone has plastic surgery and then they try to sell you a product to make it so you look like them, but they look like that because of the plastic surgery, right? If you, uh, if you got liposuction and then you're promoting flat tummy tea once it's done, no. Selling a booty blaster workout plan, but you got butt implants. No, that's scummy. Then I have a problem with it because that genuinely feels like fraud, whereas just plastic surgery in general, it's a very personal choice. And it's one that I hope people take it very seriously. They take their time. Also, preferably they go to a doctor that requires that person to be mentally cleared. But yeah, uh, those are some of my thoughts connected to the story. And of course, now whether you agree or you disagree with me, I wanna pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? And then let's talk about the situation that starts with 30 Rock, Jimmy Kimmel, and Blackface. So if you didn't know, there were episodes in the hit show 30 Rock that featured Blackface. And this is back in the news because per Tina Fey's request, 
podcast, all episodes featuring Blackface and 30 Rock will be removed from streaming and syndication. All right, for those that don't know, Tina Fey starred in and created that show. And in a note that was obtained by Variety, she apologized for featuring it in a handful of episodes writing. As we strive to do the work and do better in regards to race in America, we believe that these episodes featuring actors and race-changing makeup are best taken out of circulation. I understand now that intent is not a free pass for white people to use these images. I apologize for pain they have caused. Going forward, no comedy-loving kid needs to stumble on these tropes and be stung by their ugliness. I thank NBC Universal for honoring this request. And in addition to this decision coming from Faye and NBC, it was also supported by the show's co-creator, Robert Carlock. Currently, the show streams on Amazon Prime and Hulu. Those episodes will reportedly be removed by the end of the week, and in fact, some are already actually gone. As far as the specific implementations of Blackface, two of the episodes in question feature the character Jenna, played by Jane Krakowski in Blackface. Two others featuring guest star John Hamm doing Blackface. And you know, this move was met with mixed reaction, some seeing it as the right move. With someone writing, Oprah was in one of these episodes. There has been quite a shift in film and television and the example they set. It's no wonder why so many, myself included, were unaware of the harm done by such depictions. This is the right choice because good examples need to be set. But also, you had others saying, you know, 30 Rock isn't that old of a show and everyone knew that blackface was bad already. Some also saying these are far from the only instances of racism throughout the whole show. But also, like I said, 30 Rock was not the only thing in the news regarding blackface. This morning we saw a cancel Kimmel trending and part of this had to do with a similar conversation. Though, I, I will say this is actually over a plethora of reasons. One being that people were once again bringing up the fact that he did blackface to play Carl Malone in a sketch for The Man Show around 20 years ago. On top of that, more recently, Fox News obtained a podcast clip from 2013 where Kimmel admitted to saying the N-word multiple times while impersonating Snoop Dogg in 1996. And also, he was in the news for a non-N-word blackface reason, and that was a clip of Megan Fox on his show, Resurface. I was wearing a Stars and Stripes bikini and a red cowboy hat and, like, six-inch heels. And uh, he approved it, and they said, you know, Michael, <laughs> um, she's 15, so you can't sit her at the bar and she can't have a drink in her hand. So his solution to that problem was to then have me dancing underneath the waterfall getting soaking wet. And that's... <laughs> Perfectly wholesome. At 15, I was in 10th grade. So that's, <laughs> wow. that's sort of a microcosm of how Bay's mind works. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, that's really a microcosm of how all our minds work. But uh, some, yeah. some of us have the decency to repress those right. thoughts and pretend that they don't exist. Right, a number of people finding his reaction very creepy and inappropriate. So Kimmel gets backlash for all of these things. But of course, there's a, a big focus regarding his use of the N-word. Regarding that, you're the likes of Donald Trump Jr. chiming in saying, To be clear, I'm 100% against punishing comedians for jokes, even bad jokes from unfunny hack comedians like Jimmy Kimmel. But according to the left's own woke rules that Jimmy Kimmel wants to force others to live by, it's hard to see how ABC allows him to keep his show. Also comparing the situation to Roseanne in another tweet saying she lost her show, so Kimmel should lose his. Though we also saw a number of people pushing against that, saying that the cases are different, saying Roseanne was not canceled for previous racist statements. It was something that she said at that time, whereas Kimmel's cases are decades old. Also, the timing of all of this happening is notable. Uh, right now, Kimmel is set to host the Emmys this year, and people have wondered if this would change. Right, especially after what happened with Kevin Hart for the 2019 Oscars. Oscars. Also, all of this comes as he recently announced that he would be taking the summer off from his show. Right, that's reportedly to spend more time with his family and just take a break, though. You have some people saying that timing is suspicious, seeing as all of this started coming out at around the same time. But with all of that said, the big update to this story that happened actually as we were filming is that Jimmy Kimmel has now issued an apology and a statement. With Kimmel saying, on KROQ radio in the mid-90s, I did a recurring impression of the NBA player Carl Malone. In the late 90s, I continued impersonating Malone on TV. We hired makeup artists to make me look as much like Carl Malone as possible. I never considered that this might be seen as anything other than an imitation of a fellow human being. One that had no more to do with Carl's skin color than it did with his bulging muscles and bald head. I've done dozens of impressions of famous people including Snoop Dogg, Oprah, Eminem, Dick Vitale, Rosie, and many others. In each case, I thought of them as impersonations of celebrities and nothing more. Looking back, many of these sketches are embarrassing. He also talked about how many bring this up in an effort to say he is not in any place to criticize others for racist behavior or remarks, and about all of that he said, it is frustrating that these thoughtless moments have become a weapon used by some to diminish my criticisms of social and other injustices. I believe that I have evolved and matured over the last 20 plus years, and I hope that is evident to anyone who watches my show. I know that this will not be the last I hear of this and that it will be used again to try to quiet me. I love this country too much to allow that. I won't be bullied into silence by those who feign outrage to advance their oppressive and genuinely racist agendas. Then going on to say his summer vacation has been planned for more than a year, and it includes the next two summers off as well, adding, I will be back to work in September. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to explain, and to those I've disappointed, I am sorry. But ultimately, that is where we are 
with this story now. And, and I do want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? Do you think all of this is something that should result in a Jimmy Kimmel losing his job? Yes or no? Why? Why not? What are your thoughts about Kimmel's argument essentially saying that this is being blown up by, by people feigning outrage on the right, using this as a way to try to silence him? Yeah, I'd love to know what you think and why in those comments down below. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today and today in Awesome, brought to you by Let's Get Checked. And if you didn't know, Let's Get Checked provides confidential at-home health testing with fast online results that are reviewed by a team of physicians. And they offer a wide array of health checks for general wellness and self-care, including at-home tests for cholesterol, testosterone, fertility, STIs, colon cancer, and even COVID-19 detection. And a number that boggles my mind is that 51% of people do not get tested for things like STIs out of fear of judgment from their doctors. And you know, this doctor avoidance, it can lead to the spreading of infections and unnecessarily delayed diagnoses of common issues. And that's where Let's Get Checked comes in. You have health tests discreetly delivered to your door. Just activate, collect your sample, and ship back with a provided prepaid label. A physician reviews it, reaches out with your anonymous results, and can write a prescription if necessary. And they even have an at-home FDA-authorized COVID-19 test that Let's Get Checked will express ship straight to you. And once received by the LGC Lab, you will get secure online results within 24 hours. And so if you want to check them out and get 25% off your purchase, just head on over to trylgc.com slash defranco and use code defranco at checkout. And the first bit of awesome today is I am going to be doing a giveaway, actually multiple giveaways very soon. The team and I are currently messing around with some of our previous beautiful bastard hoodies where we're currently tie-dyeing them both with colors and also doing a bleach dye. This is kind of research for a new run that we're going to be dropping relatively soon. But that also means I'll have five completely different one of one custom tie-dye beautiful bastard hoodies. Once they're done, I'm going to be doing giveaways on individual platforms that are not YouTube. So this is the one announcement. So if you care, if you are interested in that, make sure uh, you follow me on Twitter at Philly D. You follow me on Instagram, Philly DeFranco. And finally on TikTok where I was actually able to get Philip DeFranco. Also, here's to hoping we don't mess them up so we actually have five. And the infographic show gave us spending 24 hours in soda challenge. What would happen to your body? We had Jennifer Aniston and Lisa Kudrow on Actors on Actors. We got a trailer for Over the Moon, which looks really interesting. We got a teaser for an Apple TV Plus original called Foundation. And we got a sleep expert debunking common sleep myths. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then the, the last thing we're going to talk about today is CHOP, the Capitol Hill organized slash occupied protest, also formerly known as CHAZ, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Right, and if you don't know, CHOP is a 24-7 protest that occupies roughly six blocks around a currently abandoned police precinct in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Seattle. CHOP first came to be after nine days of massive protests in Seattle following the killing of George Floyd. A lot of the protesting there had been happening in Capitol Hill and specifically near the Seattle Police Department's East Precinct. And there, we saw police setting up barricades, repeatedly clashing with protesters using tear gas, flashbangs, and pepper spray, with SPD claiming that their use of force was a response to protesters who were throwing bottles, rocks, and other projectiles at them. But also we had numerous protesters and local politicians saying that the use of force by police was not appropriate. And actually regarding that, according to reports, the Office of Police Accountability is now investigating over 12,000 complaints about police actions during the protests. But notably, what we ended up seeing on June 8th is you had Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best announcing the barricades would be removed from the precinct and the department's footprint in the area would be reduced. Right, so police board up the building, they leave, basically leaving the protesters to demonstrate freely. After that, the protesters, with the help of city officials, set up barricades, blocking off traffic from the area, declaring it an autonomous zone, free from police. They place signs on some of the barriers reading, you are entering free Capitol Hill and you are now leaving the USA. They also put a banner over the precinct that said, this space is now property of the Seattle people, painting the name on the building so it now reads the Seattle People Department. And very quickly, we saw CHOP grow to become a community. Organizers pitched tents and established a no-cop co-op which provided free water, food, hand sanitizer, and other items donated by the community. They also set up a community garden and medical stations which are often utilized to serve homeless people and sex workers. The area was also covered in art. There was a candlelit memorial for George Floyd and other black people killed by police. There's a speaker stage where discussions and teach-ins are held as well as an outdoor projector system where protesters have screened movies like The 13th, which is Ava DuVernay's film about the criminal justice system's impact on African Americans. There have also been celebrations there with dancing and music like on Juneteenth, but CHOP also has round-the-clock security patrols. And according to some reports, some of the volunteer security guards openly carry guns, this despite a firearms ban within Capitol Hill imposed by the mayor. The movement there is largely leaderless and the occupants make decisions by holding group votes. They have also issued a series of demands that are quite expensive, but the main ones are centered around defunding the police and reinvesting in the community, with a number of the demonstrators seeing CHOP as an example and a prototype of a police-free neighborhood. And for the most part, there has largely been almost no police presence in the area since the precinct was abandoned. Although, last week, police chief Best pushed back on this idea, saying, there is no cop-free zone in the city of Seattle. I think the picture has been painted in many areas that shows the city is under siege. That is not the case. But they're also saying that officers will go into the zone if there are threats to public safety. But still, the people of CHOP have largely worked and got along with city officials, and also in general, there's been peaceful dialogue and give and take from both parties. For example, last 
Last week, city workers removed the makeshift barriers and replaced them with concrete blocks to open access for local traffic, sanitation trucks, and emergency workers. Now, unsurprisingly, that pissed off the activists who said that the move shrunk their protest space and endangered the lives of people by creating what one demonstrator called a drive-by shooting lane. But activists in the zone agreed to honor the road during the day, but not overnight when they thought the site was more vulnerable. The city, for its part, has largely respected the zone and even provided them with resources. The Department of Transportation, for example, has given them portable toilets. The fire department has worked as intermediaries between them and the police. And in fact, Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin even seemed to defend CHOP after Trump attacked both it and her in a now-deleted tweet writing. Radical left Governor Jay Inslee and the mayor of Seattle are being taunted and played at a level that our great country has never seen before. Take back your city now. If you don't do it, I will. This is not a game. These ugly anarchists must be stooped immediately. Move fast. With Durkin hitting back, writing, make us all safe, go back to your bunker, hashtag Black Lives Matter. And during an interview with CNN last week, Durkin pushed back against claims that CHOP was violent. We've got four blocks in Seattle that you just saw pictures of that is more like a block party atmosphere. It's not an armed takeover. It's not a military junta. Um, we will we will make sure that we can restore this, but we have block parties and, and the like in this part of Seattle all the time. There is no threat right now to the public. Though I do want to note here that there were a number of protesters that criticized that narrative, that that shop is kind of just this block party or festival saying, no, it is a serious movement. But it, it now seems that the relationship between the city and the protesters is going to change. And that's because yesterday we saw Mayor Durkin announcing that the city will be reclaiming shop and police will go back. And very notably, this move comes after two shootings in the area over the weekend. The first shooting was on Saturday morning and resulted in the death of a 19-year-old who some reports have said was black, with him reportedly being shot and then transported to the hospital before being pronounced dead. And additionally, a 33-year-old man was shot nearby and taken to the hospital. According to reports, the victims were cared for by medics in the camp, but fire department medics did not come, with fire department officials saying that they were just following procedure which required them to wait for the police department to secure the area first, but saying that when the police tried to go into the zone, they were blocked by protesters who said that the victim had already been moved. And then in addition to that, you had the second shooting happening late on Sunday. There, a 17 year old was shot. Reportedly, he was treated at a nearby hospital and then released. Also, as of recording this video, no suspects have been identified in either shooting. And so as a result of all of this, what we saw on Monday is Durkin addressing the shootings in a press conference, saying that the city has started community-led efforts to have protesters leave voluntarily, as well as move folks experiencing homelessness to services as needed, and adding, during the day, there have been no major incidents, but we know it is very different at night, particularly in recent nights. The cumulative impacts of the gatherings and protests and the nighttime atmosphere and violence has led to increasingly difficult circumstances for our businesses and residents. Right, and that's something that's important to note here because the area that CHOP encompasses also includes local residents who live in apartments as well as numerous businesses. And of those who have spoken to reporters, their reactions to the area have been mixed. While many seem to support BLM and related movements, they don't all agree that a space like CHOP is the right answer. Others also now are saying that they do not feel safe. And that's something the police chief best hit on during the briefing, saying that in addition to the shooting, there have been reports of rape, assault, burglary, arson, and property destruction in or around the area. With Mayor Durkin also going on to say that local businesses in the protest zone that have been hurt by COVID-19 restrictions need to reopen. And continuing, it's time for people to go home. It is time for us to restore Cal Anderson Park and Capitol Hill so it can be a vibrant part of the community. We can still accommodate people who want to protest peacefully, come there and gather, but the impacts on the businesses and residents and community are now too much. While Durkin did not specify exactly how and when this will happen, she did say that they were working with community leaders and black-led organizations. She also didn't say when police would be returning to the precinct, but that the officers will do so peacefully and in the near future. And while this is likely to be a much larger process, I, I think it's very probable that Durkin and other city officials want to move soon. This especially because just this morning, Seattle police said they responded to a now third shooting near CHOP, though not in CHOP, and there reportedly one man was injured. But ultimately, that is where we are right now. Currently, it does not seem like there has been a unified response from CHOP, though some members did write an open letter proposing changes that include setting up a safe use area, creating signs encouraging intoxicated people to stay away from the protest zone and imposing a curfew at night. But also, very important to note, numerous demonstrators have said they will not leave until their demands are met. And according to NPR last week, activists have said that it is too early to give up the space, writing, only a few demands have been met. A ban on police chokeholds, for example, and the talks are still going on for the bigger asks, namely slashing the Seattle Police Department's budget and redirecting funds to health and social services. But ultimately, for now, we're gonna have to wait and see what happens next, how it happens. And of course, with this story, I would love to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts about this? And that is where I'm going to end today's show. To the three of you still here, thanks again for being a part of my day, part of this show, watching, liking the video, maybe sharing it, being a part of that conversation conversation in the comments down below. Also, hey, if one of you three is new here, definitely hit that subscribe button, tap that bell so it looks like this, so you get all notifications. But of course, as always, my name is Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you liked the video. Subscribe if you like it.